Hello and welcome to the National HIV Curriculum Mini Lecture Series. My name is Brian Wood and this lecture will focus on the medication Ibilizumab. This drug is often written as Ibilizumab UIYK, but the UIYK suffix is typically not stated with the name. This is a unique suffix assigned to biologic drugs to help with identification of the drug and to avoid confusing biologic drugs that have similar names. First, I'd like to review basic information about ibilizumab. This drug is typically used in combination with other antiretroviral medications for adults with HIV-1 who have extensive antiretroviral treatment experience and multi-class drug resistance. In my experience, its use is rare in clinical practice. It is typically reserved for individuals with significant multi-class resistance and few antiretroviral options. However, in such a scenario, this drug can be quite beneficial. One of the reasons it is used rarely in practice is the required route of administration. It is administered intravenously with a loading dose and then every two week maintenance doses. Subcutaneous and intramuscular formulations are in development and are being studied, but at this time, administration requires regular intravenous infusions. Now, of note, there are no major contraindications or drug-drug interactions. There are insufficient data for safety of ibilizumab use during pregnancy. And you can see listed here the most common adverse events that individuals receiving this drug experience. Next, let's discuss the mechanism of action of ibilizumab, which is unique. Recall that the first step of HIV entry into the host CD4 T cell is binding of the HIV envelope GP120 subunit to the CD4 receptor, which occurs here at the CD4 binding site. This is followed by conformational changes in the GP120 CD4 receptor complex that allow for interaction with a co-receptor CCR5 or CXCR4. To describe this in more detail, following binding of GP120 to the CD4 receptor, these conformational changes or rearrangements lead to repositioning of an internal region of GP120 called V3. This allows the GP120 to interact with the co-receptor. This in turn activates GP41, the other envelope glycoprotein, which facilitates fusion with the host cell membrane and finally entry into the CD4 T cell. Now, ibilizumab is a humanized IgG4 monoclonal antibody. These types of antibodies are genetically engineered from a single clone of cells and designed to target a specific antigen. Ibilizumab is designed to target a specific region of the CD4 T cell receptor. The CD4 receptor has various regions or domains, and ibilizumab binds to domain 2, or D2. I think it's important to note that domain 1, or D1, is the site where GP120 binds. So, you can see that ibilizumab does not bind at the same site as GP120. Additionally, D2, the ibilizumab binding site, is different than the site where MHC molecules bind and trigger a CD4 T cell immune response to a pathogen. So for this reason, ibilizumab binding does not block the T cell immune response. It does not interfere with CD4 immune function or cause any degree of immune suppression. In addition, binding of ibilizumab to the CD4 receptor occurs after GP120 has attached. For this reason, it is sometimes referred to as a post-attachment inhibitor. Now what happens is ibilizumab binds to the D2 region of the CD4 receptor, and this prevents those conformational changes of the CD4 receptor GP120 complex. Those changes are necessary for interaction with the CCR5 or CXCR4 co-receptor. So this is prevented by the ibilizumab binding. 
Iblizumab therefore blocks interaction with the co-receptors and subsequent steps such as HIV fusion and entry. For this reason, Iblizumab is classified as an entry inhibitor, but I want to highlight that its mechanism of action is different than the other currently available entry inhibitors, such as Maraviroc, Fostemsevir, and Infuvertide. Next, let's review the phase three clinical trial that led to approval of ibilizumab for individuals with HIV-1 and multi-class ARV drug resistance. This trial, called TMB301, was a single-arm open-label study of ibilizumab given in combination with an optimized background regimen. Optimized background regimen means the most active combination of other antiretrovirals that was available for each individual participant. You can see here the primary endpoint and secondary endpoints, and we will review results. And you can see the inclusion criteria, which was adults with HIV-1 who were taking antiretroviral therapy for at least six months, but experiencing virologic failure on that regimen as defined for this trial as an HIV RNA or viral load above 1,000 copies. And really importantly, all individuals in this trial had at least three class antiretroviral drug resistance, but they all had at least one remaining active drug that could be used as part of the optimized background regimen and added to ibilizumab. So for long-term Antiretroviral therapy, ibilizumab was not given as monotherapy. It was used in combination with at least one additional active drug, though, as we will talk about, there was a functional monotherapy phase during the trial. So if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see the design and the phases of the study. So first there was screening and enrollment of individuals whose ART regimen was Failing, again, these were individuals generally with a lot of treatment experience and multi-class drug resistance. All participants had a control period in which they continued their regimen that was failing. Then at day seven, an ibilizumab loading dose was administered and the entry regimen that, was, that had been failing was continued. Then at day 14, that entry regimen that had been failing to suppress HIV was replaced with the optimized background regimen that had at least one active agent, and ibilizumab was continued. And during this maintenance phase of the trial, ibilizumab was administered every two weeks at the dose you can see here, along with the optimized background regimen. Here is a description of the participant characteristics. In total, 40 individuals enrolled into the study. You can see here the median age, the proportion who identified as male, the proportion who identified as non-white, the mean duration since HIV diagnosis, which was 20 years, the mean CD4 T cell count, which was below 200, the mean HIV RNA or viral load at baseline, which was 4.5 log. And you can see 18% of participants had a HIV RNA or viral load above 100,000 copies at entry. Here are the virologic efficacy results after 14 days. On the left, you can see the proportion of participants who experienced a greater than 0.5 log decrease in HIV RNA level, comparing the end of the ibilizumab functional monotherapy phase, which is in gold, to the end of the control period in blue. On the right, you can see the proportion who experienced a one log decrease in HIV RNA or greater with functional ibilizumab monotherapy, again in gold, as compared to those who experienced that level of decrease during the control period. Here we can see various virologic results at week 25, meaning after 24 weeks of ibilizumab or after 23 weeks of ibilizumab plus optimized background therapy, because remember there was a one-week control period, and then a one-week functional ibilizumab monotherapy phase. Starting on the left here, you can see the proportion of participants who experienced a 0.5 log or greater decrease in HIV RNA or viral load. Then next to that, the proportion who experienced a one log or greater decrease, and then the proportion who achieved an HIV RNA below 200 copies 
and the proportion who achieved an HIV RNA below 50 copies. In this graph on the left, you can again see the proportion of all participants who achieved an HIV RNA below 50 copies in blue or below 200 copies in gray. This is again at week 25. On the right, you can see there was a remarkable difference in this outcome when examined by baseline CD4 count. Those who entered the trial with a CD4 count below 50 achieved a suppressed HIV RNA or viral load at a lower frequency than those who entered the trial with a baseline CD4 count above 50. This is the frequency of adverse events reported by participants in the trial. I'd like to make a couple notes. You can see the rate of any adverse event was 80%, but that was any adverse event that was not limited to those that were thought caused by ibilizumab. The adverse events considered related to the study drug was only 18%. Below that, you can see five individuals stopped ibilizumab because of adverse events, but I'd like to note that those adverse events were not caused by or related to the study drug. Most of those were related to opportunistic infections and advanced HIV. Now you can see here all adverse events reported by at least 10% of participants. Again, not all of these are considered related to the study drug, but clearly diarrhea was the most common side effect reported. This was mild to moderate in all patients. And then you can see other common side effects such as dizziness, fatigue, nausea, pyrexia, and rash. There are a few clinical points I'd like to make about ibilizumab activity and resistance. I'd like to emphasize that ibilizumab can be used regardless of HIV-1 tropism, meaning it has activity whether the HIV virus is using CCR5, CXCR4 or a mix to enter the CD4 T cell. So for this reason, it is not necessary to check a tropism assay before prescribing the drug. Standard genotype resistance testing does not give information about the activity or resistance to ibilizumab. Typically, if a person has never received the drug before, we presume it should be active. That said, reduced susceptibility and resistance to the drug can occur, especially with missed doses of the infusions or missed doses of other medications in the regimen. The mechanism of this resistance is not fully understood yet, but seems to correlate with changes in the V5 loop of GP120. Now, ibilizumab does not have known cross-resistance with other antiretrovirals, including other entry inhibitors. So it can be used in combinations with those medications if they are deemed to have activity against a person's HIV. So to summarize, ibilizumab is our only currently approved monoclonal antibody for use as part of an HIV treatment strategy. It is an intravenous entry inhibitor that binds to the host CD4 receptor and has a unique mechanism of action. Its role is typically as part of salvage antiretroviral therapy for individuals with multi-drug resistant HIV-1, typically who are experiencing virologic failure on other antiretrovirals and have few remaining antiretroviral options. It is typically combined with at least one other active antiretroviral agent and an optimized background regimen. It's generally well tolerated with no drug-drug interactions, and I would say it's biggest barrier to use being the required every two-week intravenous infusions. And as I mentioned, resistance may develop, but it is rare. A full understanding and availability of testing for this resistance is not yet available, but hopefully will be in the future. The production of this National HIV Curriculum Mini Lecture was supported by funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration.